everyone. Good afternoon or good evening to you, depending on where you are. I'm Greg Gumbel. Welcome to the 2017 NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. Over the next 90 minutes, we will reveal the 68-team tournament field. 32 teams are set, 36 await an at-large invitation. Joining me here at the desk, the ever-anticipatory Clark Kellogg, <laughs> along with Seth Davis, Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, Gary Parrish of CBS Sports Network will weigh in from Atlanta later in the show. So many different storylines that we've gone over over the last couple of weeks. What are you looking forward to the most? Pop Pop is showtime. That's what it's about right now. I'm anxious to see how the number one and two seed lines shook out for this committee. The top of the bracket? And the bottom of the bracket, I felt like it was the clearest bubble we've seen in a long time. Interesting number one seed debate. We'll be looking for those upsets on the 12 and 13 line. That's where the magic happens. Let's read some teams, Mr. Gumbel. <laughs> All right, guys, let's begin the reveal of the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion, Coca-Cola. The overall number one seed in the country is Villanova. The defending national champions playing in the East region, and why not? Last year's national champions, their third number one seed in school history. They won their second Big East tournament title in the last three years, their fourth straight outright Big East regular season title. No surprise there whatsoever, ours. Not at all. This team deserved to be right where they are, and they capped it off with that Big, Ten Big East Conference championship win last night. So Villanova, the top seed in the East, and they will play in Buffalo on on Thursday, and they will meet the winner of the first four matchup between Mount St. Mary's from the Northeast Conference and the Privateers of New Orleans. The Privateers, winners of the Southland regular season and tournament titles. Celebration, do they know how to celebrate in New Orleans? Probably. So it'll be St. Mary's against New Orleans for the right to move on and play Villanova. Moving on down the East region, the number eight seed, the Badgers of Wisconsin. Wisconsin reaches its 19th straight NCAA tournament, lost the Big Ten tournament championship to Michigan. The number nine seed, the Hokies of Virginia Tech, although the Badgers ready to face the Hokies of Virginia Tech. Number nine seed out of the ACC. Interesting matchup there. Buzz Williams, a Virginia Tech coach, used to coach at Marquette. He did uh, some battle with Wisconsin over the years there. A lot of familiarity. And the Hokies, a high-octane team, especially with Seth Allen and Lede coming off that bench. Virginia Tech's Hokies, their first NCAA tournament since 2007. Moving on down the East region. First round games to be played in Orlando, March 16th. Virginia's Cavaliers, the number five seed, the second team out of the ACC. Coach Tony Bennett leading his Cavaliers to 11 ACC wins, a school record fifth straight year. And they will take on the UNC Wilmington Seahawks, the number 12 seed out of the Colonial Athletic Association. And my partner just talked about where the magic happens in March in this tournament is with the 12, 13, 14 seeds. This team, UNC Wilmington, scared Duke a year ago, has just about everybody back. This is a team that I think will advance, that UNC Wilmington Seahawks. All right, and filling out the first portion of the East region, the Florida Gators out of the SEC, Coach Mike White, SEC Coach of the Year, 24 and 8 for the Gators, and they will 
will meet number 13, East Tennessee State, the Buccaneers, with a 27 and 7 record on the year. After sharing the Southeast, the Southern Conference regular season title, they won the conference tournament title. And I uh, talked about the 12 and the 13 seeds. Here's my first first round upset pick of the selection show. I like East Tennessee State to win the game. They scored 80 a game. They've got length, they got athleticism, and Florida is not as strong on the interior as that uh, four seed would indicate because they don't have their starting center who's lost for the year with an injury. All right, let's move on through the East region. Greenville, South Carolina on Friday and Sunday. The number two seed in the East, the Duke Blue Devils at 27 and 8. A lot of people thought they'd be in number one. I thought Duke would be a number one seed, but here's what people need to know. There's a new rule with this committee that says the number five overall seed or the top two seed cannot be paired with the number one overall seed. So not only was Duke not a number one seed, they are not the top two seed. That's a bit of a surprise. All right. Meanwhile, they will face the number 15 seed out of the Sun Belt Conference, Troy. At 22 and 14, they beat Texas State to win the Sun Belt Tournament title. Moving on, number seven in the East, the Gamecocks of South Carolina, and the number two team out of the Southeastern. They make their first NCAA tournament appearance since 2004, and they will meet the 10th seed Golden Eagles of Marquette. Marquette won four of its last six coming into the tournament. First and second round games in Tulsa, Oklahoma, March 17 and 19 on Friday and Sunday. The Baylor Bears, the number three seed in the East, Coach Scott Drew, saw his Baylor team finish tied for second in the Big 12. Baylor will meet the Aggies of New Mexico State, the number 14 seed from the Western Athletic Conference. Aggies won their fifth WAC tournament title in the last six years. And rounding out that East region, Coach Tim Jankovic and the SMU Mustangs, number six in the East out of the American Athletic. They won the American Athletic regular season and the tournament championship. Pony up. This team is outstanding. Positionless basketball, one of a bunch of teams in the country that play excellent small ball, but I don't know if there's a better small ball team than this team right here. Only six guys play, but they all do everything, and they do it well. And they will play the winner of the first four game from Dayton, Ohio, number 11, Providence Friars out of the Big East. Rodney Bullock leading the Friars in scoring and rebounding. And USC's Trojans, number 11 out of the Pac-12. So that's the first four games. We know those are two of the last four in. My guess is that Rhode Island may have been in that range, but by winning the A-10, they move out and Providence moves back. USC had two good home wins over SMU and UCLA. I guess that was just enough to get in. So if you're a bubble team who's not in there, that's a problem. All right, so let's review the East region now. As we take a look from the top, Villanova, Wisconsin, Virginia, Florida, some big names at the top part of that bracket. Some big names, but I think Villanova gets out of this bracket. I think this team has a chance, actually a really good chance, to repeat as champions. They've got all the intangibles and the improvement of Jalen Brunson and taking the reins of that point guard position, and Josh Hart has played like a player of the year, I think they've got enough to get it done again. So. Yeah, I've talked about East Tennessee State. I like them in the first round uh, over Florida, and UNC Wilmington is going to be a tough out. It's hard to pick against Virginia and the type of defense they play. We talked about Villanova last year's uh, national champs. Two years ago, uh, the national champs being uh, the Duke Blue Devils, and you think if we got a Duke-Villanova regional final in Madison <laughs> Square Garden, that might raise the roof a little bit, but as Villanova we, being number take, one overall. You take a look at the lower half of that, those Duke Blue Devils, the number two seed, are hard to ignore the way they've been playing. Yeah, I actually like Duke to come out of this uh, region and uh, get to the Final Four, but I do like SMU uh, Boy, to beat you. Baylor and uh, and go to the Sweet 16. I'm pointing up right with you. And Bob. I would love to see a Duke-SMU matchup. If it were to happen, that would be terrific theater between the lines. All right, guys, dozens of teams across the country standing by to see where they'll go, whom they will play, and for some, if they even make it into the NCAA tournament at all. When the selection show continues, we will reveal the Midwest region of the way. CBS Sports NCAA Men's Basketball Championship Selection Show is sponsored by AT&T. The Quicksilver Card from Capital One. And by Coca-Cola. Taste the feeling.
Welcome back to the NCAA Basketball Championship Selection Show. One bracket down, three to go. Let's move to the upper right quadrant of the bracket as we continue our reveal of the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion, AT&T. The second overall number one seed, the Kansas Jayhawks. Out of the Big 12, Coach Bill Self making it 19 straight NCAA tournaments. Number one seed for the second straight year and the 13th time overall. And they're led by Frank Mason, who leads the Big 12 in scoring three-point field goal percentage shoot the Kansas Jayhawks. Now, let's see who they'll meet. These games being played in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They'll play the winner of the first four in Dayton. North Carolina Central University Eagles. Out of the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, the Eagles, the MEAC regular season champions. They won the MEAC tournament over Norfolk State, and they will play UC Davis, the Aggies. Under coach Jim Les, defeating UC Irvine in the Big West Tournament Championship, their first ever tournament appearance. I'll tell you what, that NC Central and UC Davis game, very interesting because both of these teams get after you defensively. Can't wait to see that one myself. All right, let's move on down the Midwest region bracket. Coach Jim Laranega's Miami Hurricanes, the number eight seed out of the ACC. They had NCAA tournament appearances, wins over North Carolina, Duke, and Virginia. So the Miami Hurricanes with their 21 and 11 record on the year. Who will they face? Out of the Big Ten, the Spartans of Michigan State. Tom Izzo making it 20 straight NCAA tournament appearances. So the Michigan State Spartans will take on the Miami Hurricanes. Moving on to first round play in Milwaukee on Thursday and Saturday. The Cyclones of Iowa State. They beat West Virginia to win their third Big 12 tournament title in the last four years, and they will meet the Wolfpack of Nevada. Out of the Mountain West, they won the Big West regular season and tournament championship. And they were an outstanding team all season long. I spy another 5-12 upset in the making. I'm on the other side of that equation. Both excellent small ball teams, but I like the Cyclones. The point guard, Monte Morris, has been absolutely tremendous all season long. All right, moving on down. A couple of teams we've talked about a lot over the last couple of weeks. The Purdue Boilermakers, the third team out of the Big Ten and the number four seed in the Midwest region. Boilermakers won the regular season Big Ten championship and they bring Caleb Swanigan to the dance. They will play the Catamounts of Vermont out of the America East. Program record 29 wins on the year. So Purdue and Vermont meeting up in Milwaukee. Moving on to the games in Indianapolis on Friday and Sunday. The number two seed, the Louisville Cardinals, the 15 out of the ACC. Coach Rick Pitino, his 21st NCAA tournament. And the Louisville Cardinals, well, they bring a lot to the table, don't they? They sure do. Tons of size, good depth. Donovan Mitchell has had a player of the year caliber year. The key for this team is, are the big guys going to be consistent scoring? If they are, this is a team that could get to the Final Four. All right, out of the Ohio Valley, Louisville will face the 15th seed Gamecocks of Jacksonville State. Coach Ray Harper in his first year takes the Gamecocks to their first ever NCAA tournament appearance. From Jacksonville State, looking forward to Rick Pitino and the Louisville Cardinals. Yeah, a lot of red in that game. Yeah, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of points in that game. First one to 90 wins that one. Going up the ladder in the Midwest region, the Michigan Wolverines. Impressive down the stretch and in the Big Ten tournament. Won four games in four days to win the Big Ten tournament champion. And interesting seeing them as a seven seed. Respectable, maybe a hair low, but you saw Purdue the regular season champ in the Big Ten as a four seed. So that's an example of the committee valuing a regular season champion over a tournament champion. They seem pretty happy nonetheless. As well they should be. 24 and 11 on the year and 10 and 8 in the Big Ten, but they are headed to Indianapolis. Who will they face? Oklahoma State's Cowboys, the fourth team out of the Big 12. They ended the season winning nine of their last 13 games. Oklahoma State, 20 and 12 on the year. If you haven't seen Jawan Evans, you're in for a treat. This little guy is dynamic, extremely quick, can score a multitude of ways. But I like the momentum of Michigan, how they've been playing, and I picked the Wolverines to win that matchup. The celebration goes on at Oak State. Meanwhile, first round game in Sacramento, California on Friday. The Oregon Ducks, second team out of the Pac-12, number three seed. They want to share the Pac-12 regular season title with Arizona. Yeah, interesting seeing Oregon on the three line. Thought maybe they could get to the two. I'd wonder if the committee took into account the fact that Oregon lost its premier shot blocker and three-point shooter Chris Boucher to a season-ending ACL. I would bet that was at least a factor Without in question, the discussion. Seth, I'm definitely, I would almost be ready to um, take your word on that. Uh, All thank right. you. Meanwhile, First time for everything. Oregon will play the 14th seed in the Midwest, and that's the Gales of Iowa. Iona out of the Metro.
Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference coach Tim Cluis. They, they beat Siena in overtime in the MAC final. Their offense chalks up 90 or more points nine times this season. Yeah, they can put it in the basket. They shoot threes. They play a freewheeling style. We've seen this team in the tournament for the last five years, and they're always entertaining. And on the last level in the Midwest region, the number six seed, the Creighton Blue Jays. Number four team out of the Big East, Coach Greg McDermott. Creighton reaches the Big East Tournament Final before losing the top seed Villanova, but the Blue Jays are on their way to Sacramento, California. Question is, who do they meet? We just saw them in action today. The Rams of the University of Rhode Island out of the Atlantic 10. They reached the tournament for the first time since 1999. Getting the automatic bid in the A-10, but you see them as an 11 seed. So I do wonder then if they were in fact in the first four had they lost that game today or even in the field altogether. That's pretty low. Let's take a look back now at the Midwest region and we'll begin at the very top where Kansas is the number one overall seed. Everybody pretty much had Kansas. Without question, this was something we had anchored in probably as far back as maybe two weeks ago or so. Villanova and Kansas clear locked into those one two spots Louisville very interesting two seed I thought they might be on the three line but this is a dangerous team a team that has the potential to play um, well into the end of the month as we look at this region you have to look up and down the ladder and figure out whether who, who is going to post oppose a challenge well first of all how about a Kansas Michigan State matchup in a second round that would be a lovely treat I actually like the Nevada to go all the way to the Sweet 16 and then that Creighton Rhode Island game is interesting to me because Creighton lost their starting point guard he's gone for the season whereas Rhode Island got healthier, played better late. I like Rhode Island to win that game and in fact beat Oregon, who also has an injury uh, issue. So I like Rhode Island to get to the Sweet 16. And that Michigan-Louisville second round game is very difficult for me. It's hard to imagine Rick Pitino not figuring out a way to defend all those three-point shooters. I'll go with the cards, but not with a ton of confidence. All right, guys. Half the field <laughs> is set. It's almost time for bracket games. Play with friends and four prizes with the CBS Sports app. Get it now to be ready as soon as the full bracket is live. Two brackets done, two to go. Still a lot of teams waiting to hear their names, including Gonzaga, Northwestern eagerly awaiting its first ever tournament bid. How about Princeton, the Ivy League champs, Northern Kentucky, Notre Dame, Bucknell. The selection show continues live on CBS after this. Two of our four brackets have been filled. We now move to the bottom right quadrant as we continue to reveal the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champion, Capital One. The third overall number one seed out of the South, the North Carolina Tar Heels, the number one seed they will play in the South. And this is a shock to some people. Well, it's a surprise to me because Duke beat North Carolina twice. Carolina has seven total losses to Duke's eight losses. But again, Clark, North Carolina won the ACC regular season title. Purdue won the Big Ten regular season title. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking to the chairman, Mark Hollis, about how they value that achievement because it seems it's pretty hot. It seems like it's very high. And we wondered about where those teams would fall on the seed line. We kind of had a good idea of what the six to eight teams were for one and two. And now we know Carolina is right there and probably has been there for a bit. All right, let's take a look at who Carolina is going to play out of the Southwestern Athletic. It's Texas Southern, the number 16 seed. They won the SWAC regular season title as well as the tournament championship. The number eight seed in the South, the Razorbacks of Arkansas. Coach Mike Anderson never had a losing season in his 15 year coaching career. Arkansas 25 and nine. They will meet the ninth seeded Pirates of Seton Hall, the fifth seed out of the Big East. Back to back NCAA tournament appearances since uh, PJ Carlissimo way back back in the early 90s. Now to first and second round games in Milwaukee on Thursday night. The Minnesota Golden Gophers are the number five seed. Coach Richard Pitino, the 2017 Big Ten Coach of the Year. And the Gophers are in celebration mode. Great turnaround on the year. Great turnaround for Richard Pitino. Struggled last year, and this team has played at a high level most all season long. Let's see how they feel about this. They will play the number 12 seed Blue Raiders of Middle Tennessee. They ran through Conference USA, winning 17 of 18 regular season games. The regular season championship won the tournament title. They've done a lot. Beat Michigan State last year in that shocking game. They returned a lot of those players. Added a great transfer into Corey Williams. I spy another five. 12 upset. Blue Raiders are going to win this game. Little Tennessee, 30 and 4 on the season. Moving on down. 
to the number four seed, the Bulldogs of Butler, the number six team out of the Big East, a third straight NCAA tournament appearances. They handed Villanova two of their three regular season losses. They will meet the Eagles of Winthrop, the number 13 seed coming out of the Big South. They won a share of the Big South regular season championship and then won the conference title. So let's continue to move on now. First round games in Indianapolis on Friday. The Kentucky Wildcats, the number two seed out of the SEC. They won the SEC regular season and tournament titles. They ran off 11 straight wins coming into the tournament. Malik Monk, the SEC freshman of the year, they got a lot going for them. Good ball team. Look good today winning that title. All right, who will Kentucky play? The number 15 seed out of the Horizon League, Northern Kentucky. Coach John Brannon, Horizon League Coach of the Year, and their NCAA tournament appearance is their very first. Congratulations to the Norse of Northern Kentucky. Let's continue up the ladder. The number seven seed in the South is the Dayton Flyers at 24 and seven on the year. Coach Archie Miller, school record 15 conference wins on the year. Their second straight regular season Atlantic 10 title this year, and they will meet the Shockers of Wichita State out of Missouri Valley. Very surprised, very surprised to see Wichita State as a 10 seed. I thought they could get maybe up to the eight line. Uh, shows to me that the committee valuing their RPI breakdown as opposed to some of these other performance metrics where the Shockers have been in the top 10 and 20 all season. All right, rounding out the South region. First round games in Sacramento, Friday and Sunday. The number three seed, UCLA Bruins, Coach Steve Alford. Commandeered a school record 28 regular season wins this year. Potent offense, led the nation in scoring, field goal percentage, and assists. There's not a team that scores the ball easier than the Bruins, and Lonzo Ball has been the catalyst of it all. This is a good spot for the Bruins. I see them perhaps, I see them coming out of the South. They will meet the 14th seed Golden Flashes of Kent State. They won the MAC tournament title and a trip to their first NCAA tournament since 08. And then at the very top, the number six seed in the South region, the Bearcats of Cincinnati. Cincinnati reached the American Athletic Conference Tournament Championship game before losing to SMU, but they are at number six, and they will take on the winner of the first four game in Dayton between Kansas State's Wildcats, the fifth Big 12 team into the tournament, and Wake Forest Demon Deacons. So we now know that Providence, USC, Kansas State, and Wake Forest were your last four at-large teams in. If you were a bubble team hoping to get into that first four, you're not very happy right now, because that is done. All right, to the review. South region looks like this. It starts with North Carolina and who might pose a danger to them. I think um, UCLA, quite honestly. I mean, I think UCLA is a team because of its offensive ability. They've knocked off high quality opponents and they've got a transcendent point guard, I think, in Lonzo Ball. And I know, I know both of you, we all love Middle Tennessee. I love Middle <laughs> Tennessee. I like him to be Butler in the second round and go to the Sweet 16. It feels like it's been that kind of season uh, in college basketball. A couple of great potential matchups there in the bottom half of that bracket because first of all, remember, Kentucky ended Wichita State's uh, undefeated season a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. And plus, two of the best regular season games this season was when UCLA won at Kentucky. Kentucky and then also uh, North, Kentucky, North Carolina and Kentucky. In Between Vegas. the three of those schools, 25 total NCAA championships. This is the glamour bracket. <laughs> and on this side of the bracket, you guys are saying, watch UCLA, yep. watch Kentucky. Exactly. That's what I think. And then you take a look at this Dayton-Wichita State matchup. Dayton, a small ball team. They play with the chip. I wouldn't concede this one to Wichita State. I like the Flyers in that one. All right, guys, we remind you to play the official bracket game of NCAA March Madness. The Capital One NCAA March Madness Bracket Challenge is almost ready for your picks. To get your bracket started now at NCAA.com or in the March Madness Live app. We are three quarters of the way through the brackets. A lot of teams still await their fate, including Arizona, Pac-12 champs, Northwestern, still awaiting to hear its name called Princeton, representing the Ivy League and the Atlantic Sun champs Florida Gulf Coast. The selection show continues live here on CBS after this message and a word from your local station. back everyone three brackets down one to go several schools still on the edge of their respective seats waiting to see if they make it into the field of 68 so let's get to it the final region of the tournament brackets from the NCAA and its corporate champions the fourth overall number one seed is Gonzaga to be playing in Salt Lake City on Thursday 
March the 16th, Gonzaga's Bulldogs out of the West Coast, 18 straight NCAA tournament appearances, and Mark Few, West Coast Conference Coach of the Year. Great choice by the committee. Couldn't, couldn't agree with this one more. So at 32-1 and 17-1 and and in the West Coast Conference, let's see who they take on. They will meet the Jackrabbits of South Dakota out of the Summit League. They won the Summit League Tournament Championship, finished with a record of 18 and 16 on the year, but that automatic bid goes to the Jackrabbits. Now, the number eight seed out of the West. There they are, the Northwestern Wildcats. 78 years in the making. Their first ever NCAA tournament, 23 wins, a school record. There is a well-deserved celebration. Hey, what took you guys so long? <laughs> Welcome to the party. Enjoy. I'm going to yeah, first time I've ever applauded on a selection yep, show. No Welcome. doubt about it. Welcome. That is special. Congratulations to the Wildcats. Now, who do they meet? The fifth seed out of the SEC, the Commodores of Vanderbilt. Coach Bryce Drew's squad, most losses by an at-large team in NCAA tournament history. They come in at That's a healthy number for them, isn't it? I'll tell you what, we talk about him as a bubble clock, but strength, a nine seed. Strength of schedule, though, I think is part of what drove that type of seed. Congratulations to the Commodores. What a matchup in that 8-9. In that That's going to be a lot of fun. Yes, it Two will Two coaches' be. sons. That's right. That's right. You notice it was selfie time in Evanston, Illinois. All right, <laughs> first round games in Buffalo, New York on Thursday and Saturday. Saturday, the number five seed, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Another team out of the ACC, the eighth. Coach Mike Bray's team reached the ACC tournament final before losing to Duke. So the Fighting Irish are there at 25 and 9, and they will meet the number 12 seed, Princeton Tigers. Out of the Ivy League, Coach Mitch Henderson's squad, first time they had a league tournament, and they beat Yale to qualify. Continuing on down the ladder now, number four seed. They're Princeton Tigers in celebration <laughs> mode. Nice to be young. <laughs> All right, the number four seed in the West region, the Mountaineers of West Virginia. Made a trip to the Big 12 Tournament Championship game. Coach Bob Huggins' squad went 26-8 and eight on the year, and they will meet the Bison of Bucknell out of the Patriot League. Two straight regular season Patriot League titles in two years at Bucknell. Be a tricky matchup for West Virginia. Press Virginia likes to turn you over and get offense that way. This Bucknell group, very good with the ball and very versatile offensively. They come into the tournament winners of 14 of their last 16 games. Now, continuing on, Salt Lake City on Thursday and Saturday. The number two seed in the West, the Wildcats of Arizona at 30 and four on the year. They share the regular season Pac-12 title with Oregon. They beat the Ducks in the Pac-12 tournament title game. Congratulations to the Wildcats. Who do they meet? The number 15 seed from the Big Sky, the Fighting Hawks of North Dakota. North Dakota won the Big Sky regular season and tournament championships. They come into the NCAA tournament winners of 10 of their last 11 games. Let's move up the ladder. The Gales of St. Mary, the number seven team. They won 20 games for a 10th straight year. 28 and four, they will meet VCU. We saw the Rams earlier today, the Atlantic Tournament Final. They lost to Rhode Island, but out of the Atlantic 10, they're the third team out of the A-10. It's the Rams going up against St. Mary's. And first round games in Orlando, Florida on Thursday. The Seminoles of Florida State are the number three seed in the West region. Leonard Hamilton's team returns to the NCAA tournament after a four-year absence. A lot of people like this Florida State team. And with good reason, a deep athletic team that has scoring in the backcourt. Um, Dwayne Bacon is the guy who makes it happen for them offensively, but a very, very good basketball team and a hard team to prepare for because of the size and athleticism. Talk about making things happen. Look who they play. The Eagles of Florida Gulf Coast University, the number 14 seed out of the Atlantic Sun. They won the Atlantic Sun regular season and tournament championship. So we get Florida Gulf Coast playing Florida State in Orlando. What are we to do to deserve that? Another upset special for you, Clark Kellogg. I know you love these Eagles. Yes, I like I do. them to beat Florida I'm with State. you there. And I think they're going to the Sweet 16. How about that?
You take all your upset specials to yeah, the Sweet 16. Don't, everybody don't use me to fill out your brackets, please. I'm having fun up here. All right, let's round out the West region. The number six seed, the Terps of Maryland, the seventh Big Ten team into the tournament, Mello Trimble. First team all Big Ten selection. He averages 17 points a game. He spurs the Terps, and they will meet the Musketeers of Xavier out of the Big East. Oh, we always torture that bubble team in the 11th seed, the last team into the field. Uh, I'm sure it's been a long wait for Chris Mack and company, and that means if you're Syracuse, if you're Illinois State, we got no spots left. All right, let's go back to the top of the bracket now. Gonzaga, according to the numbers, the team to beat, but also there, Notre Dame and a fired up Northwestern team. Yeah, I like Gonzaga's path here. This is a balanced team with size and depth and excellent guards. I look for Gonzaga to get through this part of the bracket and have a strong chance to get to the Final Four. Kind of hard to pick against Notre Dame, but I think that's a comfortable matchup for Gonzaga. Yeah. They, they, uh, they might struggle with a team that will try to slow them down and pound it in. That's the exact opposite, exact opposite of what Notre Dame wants to do. And of course, Gonzaga and Arizona played early in the season, so if those two should meet up in the regional final, Alonzo Trier didn't play for Arizona and I talked about Florida Gulf Coast I think they're gonna beat Florida State and Maryland and that's three double-digit seeds in the Sweet 16. All right, guys. Just guessing. With the brackets <laughs> now complete in the 36 at-large bids handed out, we turn our attention to the teams that barely made the field, the teams that wound up on the wrong side of the bubble. The last four to make it in play against each other. Kansas State faces Wake Forest. Providence takes on USC. They are part of the first four games that will be played Tuesday and Wednesday in Dayton, Ohio. Teams that were close, but not in the tournament in alphabetical order. California, Illinois State, Iowa, and Syracuse. These teams will be given number one seeds in the NIT tournament. Yeah, Syracuse, to me, they had that six, those six top 50 wins, great wins. Every single one of them was at home. They only won two games outside of the Carrier Dome all season long. When you're talking about the other teams they are being compared to, that was no question the fatal flaw on the resume of a very good basketball. And I always defer to you because you dig into the numbers a little more than I do, but I'm not, no issues with any of that. It's hard to get into this tournament. It's a select invitation earn your way in and as a result there are going to be some teams that look close but don't get there and that's part of the magic of this three weeks and, to a and, championship and you can put Illinois State under that right. umbrella that's because right. I know you guys have lobbied strong for them I would have loved to see an Illinois State in the field the fact is and I know that it's unfair if you're in a league like the Missouri Valley Conference you have to schedule outside of your conference even if it means playing only one game yeah. on the road without a return this is a very good basketball team but their only good win came at home against Wichita State, and then the Shockers pretty much uh, dominated them in the conference tournament. So uh, they're good enough to win games in this tournament. A lot of teams that aren't here are good enough to win. But that's the not the criteria. That is not it. All right, guys, a reminder, enter Infinity's round-by-round -round bracket where each correct pick nets a donation to coaches versus cancer. Up next, we'll check in with our guys down in Atlanta, EJ, Charles, and Gary, their insight on the brackets. We step aside and look at some of the joyous celebrations that have taken place this evening. Welcome you back to the selection show. Our crew down in Atlanta ready to jump in all, all the activity with their thoughts and impressions. Ernie, take it away. Greg, thank you very much. We're having a great time. I, I always love this this day of the year when you know everybody's around the set and getting ready to fill out their fill out their brackets. Uh, Gary Parrish from CBS is here. Charles Barkley, of course, is here. Uh, Kenny Smith will be with us on Thursday when we're all in New York. Uh, he is attending to a family illness right now. We send our best to Kenny and his family. Uh, okay, so we saw the 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 four number one seeds. Uh, any issues there, Chuckster? Uh, no, no issues with the number one seeds, but I got. Got an issue with a couple. Well, I'm just talking number one. Seeds. No, I have no. Um, I have no problem with the number oh, one. Seeds. Do you? No Gary. big issue. I think they got three of them right. I think Villanova, Kansas, Gonzaga were absolutes. Little surprise, North Carolina got the fourth number one seed, and here's why. The committee often talks about a total body of work, not so much in your conference, but what have you done throughout the entire season? Well, Duke's total body of work is better than North Carolina's. They got more top 25 RPI wins. They got more top 50 RPI wins. They beat North Carolina twice. They played a tougher schedule. If you're going by total body of work, I don't know how Duke got passed over. Okay, Charles, you're buying that? It's, now do you have an issue? It's apples or oranges, <laughs> to be right. honest with you. They play in the best conference in America. Uh, I North Carolina, to me, been a little bit more consistent. 
Duke has been up and down. Obviously, some that had to do with injuries. Uh, they had some stuff going on off the court also uh, with uh, with Grayson. But uh, I got no problem. It, it's one or two. And so I kind of short-circuited you moments ago. You said, no, I have no problem with the four number one seeds, but I do have an issue. So what were you looking to see what you had an issue with? Wichita State and Middle Tennessee. Uh, they should have been seated higher, I think, because they're not a fluke. Both of these teams come in with a great track record. Obviously, Wichita State track record is a lot longer than Middle Tennessee, but they did not reward them for being consistent with what they accomplished the last couple of years. They should not be seated as low as they are. Middle Tennessee and Wichita State should be seated higher. Gary, what grabbed your attention? Well, let's focus on the Wichita State thing for a second. He's exactly right. There are some metrics out there that have Wichita State as a top 10 team in America. The idea that they're a 10 seed now, and that's not just awful for Wichita State and unfair, it's terrible for the teams that have to play Wichita State because suddenly you're playing an opponent that's a higher caliber team than you're supposed to be playing in that round of 64. Just, it, it remind, it's reminiscent, reminiscent of when they were undefeated and they just and they lowered Kentucky's uh, uh, and had to play them in the early, right. early the tournament. Right. Now they got to play them in the next round. They're just really unfair. You know, we used to uh, undervalue uh, Gonzaga. And they've been consistent for the last X amount of years, and now they're starting to get respect. We're not doing the same at Wichita State, and that, that is wrong. When you look at who uh, did not get into the, to the field of 68, and I know when the day began, one of the questions you were looking at was, what's going to happen to Syracuse? As it turns out, they're out. I'll give the committee credit on this. I think they got the 68 teams correct. Uh, Syracuse was a team that was obviously on the bubble, but they did so much damage to their resume in November and December. They got some big wins, more top 50 RPI wins than most other bubble teams, but the losses matter as well. I'm not surprised they got left out, especially with an RPI in the 80s. Hey, hold on, but let me say one thing, Ernie. What? The committee, you know, like when jocks say, I don't read the newspaper, I don't watch television, the committee does the same thing. You know, when, when they, last year was a big deal that Syracuse got in and people thought they shouldn't get in, they made it all the way to the Final Four. I think they used reverse psychology this year and then left them out. You know, uh, one of the things about the first four, which we've had since 2011 when VCU made the run to the Final Four, every year somebody from the first four has gone to at least the round of 32. So when you look at the, the first four games coming up Tuesday and Wednesday, who do you think has it in them to go to that first weekend? I win a couple of games here. I think the trim probably stops. I don't love any of those to win a couple of games, but if forced to pick one, I'll go with Wake Forest, and here's why. They entered the NCAA tournament having won four of their past five games. They got a kid in John Collins who is somebody who can go out and get 30, 35 and win a basketball game for you. He averages 19 and 10. Danny Manning's done a great job with that team to get them in the NCAA tournament. If you're looking for a pick out of the first four to advance, maybe it's them. Uh, so Maddie would be waiting for the winner of Kansas State. Great, Wake Forest. great job by Dan and Manning, one of my yeah. old teammates. Glad to see you doing a great job at Wake Forest. But I'm going to say that the, the, the winner between Providence and Southern Cal, to me, those teams right there, they actually can actually win a game in the tournament. They had to, and go up against SMU, and that is going to be a, a tough chore. Yeah, but I think they can beat SMU. Obviously you do because you're picking either Providence <laughs> or, or Southern Cal. Those are the impressions from Charles and Gary here in Atlanta. Uh, we're dying to hear from the guys who will call the national championship game. Jim Nance, Bill Raftery, Grant Hill standing by. Hey, fellas. Hello there, Ernie. Hey. Uh, listen, for this discussion, we're going to make some assumptions. We've never had a 16 beat a one, so we're going to look at the path to the final four for each of the four number one seeds, and we're going to see what they would face if they had to face the best seed in every situation. For example, Grant, let's go to the east. This is the New York Regional. Villanova, the number one overall. If they had to play the best seed each step of the way, it would be Wisconsin, Florida, and Duke. What do you make of this a, bracket? A tough roll for the Wildcats. Wisconsin as an eight seed. I had him at six. There's some sleepers out there, too. SMU, Baylor, and, of course, Duke possibly in the regional finals. Tough road. Who do you like in that bracket? I, I love Jay Wright, but I got to go with Duke. They're playing great. <laughs> yep, no question. Midwest, uh, Kansas City is the regional site here, Raft, and it's the Jayhawks have to play the best seed every step of the way. So they place Miami, uh, then Purdue and Louisville. What a tough road. No question about it. Iowa State or Purdue is a big one. Of course, Oregon, uh, Michigan, or Louisville. This is not an easy road. No question about it. Who do you like? Uh, I think a sleeper. Well, I like Kansas, obviously. Yeah, I know you like Kansas. You got a sleeper out of yeah, that bracket? Michigan, maybe. Okay. Well, so after here, what we, we saw this for today, 
As we shift to the Memphis Regional, where North Carolina is the number one, I have never seen so much marquee through the first three seeds in one bracket. You got North Carolina, Kentucky, and UCLA. That's 24 national titles between the top three seeds and the path to the Final Four if the Tar Heels face the best seed each step with the Arkansas, Butler, and Kentucky. Well, you got, they got Arkansas has got to play seed in all. Let's just got that. No question about Butler. Maybe the size should prevail, but how about that, Kentucky? I think to get to the 16, Carolyn might be okay, but the Wildcats, tough road there. And Kentucky, UCLA, a possible Sweet 16 matchup. Who do you like in, the, in Memphis? Uh, uh, you're killing me here. North Carolina? I like Carolina to win it all. Okay, there you go. And finally out west, let's check it out with Gonzaga's road here. Grant Northwestern, Chris Collins, your old buddy, taking the Wildcats on this historic journey, West Virginia and Arizona. Wow, what a possible matchup in the regional finals, Arizona. Obviously, you got some sleepers in there. Uh, Notre Dame, Maryland, Florida State, all tough opponents. It's going to be a tough road here for the Bulldogs to finally persevere and get to the Final Four. So who wins the West? Uh, it's hard to beat a, a, two team, a team twice in the season. I'm going with Arizona uh, getting ooh, to the Final Four. Okay. That's the latest from here. Ernie, back to you in Atlanta. All right, Jimmy, thank you very much. Up next, the guys in New York will talk live with the man who oversaw this year's selection process, the chair of the NCAA Men's Basketball Selection Committee, Mark Hollis. The NCAA, CBS, and Turner would like to recognize and thank our official NCAA corporate champions and corporate partners for their ongoing support of the NCAA and NCAA student athletes throughout the year. A short while ago, the 2017 NCAA Selection Committee finalized the bracket over at the Marriott Marquis here in New York City. You can follow your teams around the tournament. Book your hotel at NCAA.com slash travel brought to you by Marriott. Time to get some insight into this year's selection and bracketing process. Joining us is the man who engineered that process, Mark Hollis, the chair of the NCAA Division I Men's Basketball Committee and the athletics director at Michigan State University. So many questions, so little time. Uh, my two friends here were steadfast in saying Duke was going to be a number one seed. They were not. That's the first thing that jumped at us when we first looked at the bracket. What happened? Well, I think part of the thing is you have to understand the process. And the process is it doesn't start Sunday morning. It starts on Wednesday. And Duke came in as the top-ranked team on the four line. So as you go through the week and they're winning games, three games against top 25 teams, and we go into scrubbing, they're working their way up. And they got stopped along the way by a team that, that won both its regular season and conference tournament and, frankly, weren't compared against teams that were on the one line. So th th that's what struck me is the fact that they're in the region mm -hmm. with Villanova means they're not even the top two seeds. So I want to get back to this thing where you talk about winning the regular season in their conference because you right. guys are always talking about overall body of work. Duke has eight losses. North Carolina has seven. They played three times. Duke won twice, including once on a neutral court. Duke was better away from home. Duke had the tougher strength of schedule. So overall body of work, it seems pretty definitive that Duke should be ranked ahead of North Carolina, but North Carolina won the regular season ACC. So was that the determining factor? Yeah, I think when you when we came into the studio earlier in the week, we were very clear that these are our four solid one teams, and that included North Carolina at that time. Then when you go through the week and you start doing the scrubbing process and you're working teams up and down the line based upon results, Duke had the largest jump by going two lines, going from the four line to the two line. And as the committee was going through that process, making their votes, on the scrubbing process, they got stopped along the way and they didn't get to a point where they could be compared. So winning the regular season title in your league is something that is weighing very heavily with you guys, I guess. Winning your regu regular season title, but also having the non-conference wins that go with it. And now you got to remember, Duke picked up three top 25 wins along the week. That moved them along, but they didn't have that when the initial seed came out. Did any teams move in that top four group, looking at Oregon particularly, considering what happened with Chris Boucher? Could you talk a little bit about how that played out for the Ducks? Yeah, I think, you know, there were a lot of conversations that were going on amongst both one and two. And um, I, that was a consideration. It was on the table, as most injuries are, mm -hmm. or, or players that are not available. But, um, you know, I think for the most part, at the end, we came um, to a conclusion that, that the ones were there, nobody came up. 
within the twos, you saw a little bit of shift. Arizona is another team mm -hmm. that moved up considerably as the week went along. Okay, gotcha. Why no Syracuse? Syracuse, I think you, you said it right. As you look at their resume, 2-11 and 11, um, on the road, uh, that became a theme was both, both how did you do against teams that are in the tournament and how did you do on the road. And um, Syracuse had struggles in both of those. Their non-conference schedule wasn't that, that difficult of a schedule by means, and they still struggled in that non-conference segment as well. Mark, contentious might be too strong a word. Let's say disgust. What was the most disgust item in, in producing this bracket. Which, what, what did the committee talk about the most? Yeah, I think the most discussed, and, and um, it, when, you, when you're talking or earlier on, you were talking about upsets and you were talking about teams maybe not being seated high enough, and that has to do with the competitive nature of this tournament. 20 teams that were either um, the one seed in their conference tournament or a co-champ ended up winning their, yeah. their league tournament. Last year there was 11, this year there's 20. Right. So the competitive nature of this tournament really made it challenging in the seeding process and really made it challenging as we went down into the depths of, uh, of the, the bracket. So that was probably the most discussed process that, that we had was because of that competitive. So that nature. clearly compresses the gap between teams and also sets up for what I think will be phenomenal matchups throughout the bracket as we get started. It really does, and I was watching your eyes, all of you, when you were reading, reading through yeah. the brackets, and you were like, wow, this is a big matchup. Wow, this is a big matchup. And that's what you have in here. I've been here five, this is my fifth year, and mm -hmm. fortunately, final year on the committee. <laughs> um, but by far, I can say with 100% with certainty, this is the most competitive bracket that I've seen in those five years. You keep using this word scrubbing. Can you explain how that works and what exactly that means? Right. It's a process and, it, and it's written out and very public and very transparent. But the, the, the scrubbing process is once you see teams, you do head to head comparisons in order to move teams up. You can't or, or down. You can't just say, let's take these five and move them here or let's compare a team that's on the four line with a team that's on the one line. They have to be scrubbed and go head to head against teams that are above or below them. We do that quite frequently frequently throughout the day, Friday, Saturday, and this morning. Mark Hollis, congratulations. Yes, there thank you. Be, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of griping this time around. <laughs> we'll see yeah. in Phoenix. Oh, it's, so all, fine. it's, it's all good. good. All right, we'll, uh, we thank Mark for sharing his insight. We'll take a quick break here. When we come back, the head coach of Northwestern, Chris Collins, joins us live to talk about his school's first ever NCAA tournament bid. Wildcast Nation will be celebrating long into the night in Evanston, Illinois. Welsh Ryan Arena enjoying one last hurrah while undergoing some major renovation. That's what you call the excitement of March Madness on full display. Those of you who missed any of the brackets, we're going to recap the entire tournament field one more time for you. And we will begin with the East and the number one seed. To no one's surprise, most everyone expected it to be the Villanova Wildcats. Exactly, and I'm moving them all the way to Phoenix, the Villanova Wildcats. I see them making it happen. I'm old enough to remember when people thought Jay Wright couldn't coach in March. Wins a national championship, loses a couple starters back to the number one overall team uh, in the tournament. And I, I just just think we got a collision course to one of these epic NCAA tournament games Duke versus Villanova Madison Square Garden with a chance to go to the final well, I think Duke's gonna we have it. to get by the ponies SMU I look to project I'm projecting SMU out to meet Duke and um I think the ponies can make it happen there, so uh, we that was might not. We might, we you, might are you, not. Are you there yet? I'm there. I'm there with SMU, okay. and we. Um, that means that you won't have that Duke Villanova uh, matchup okay. you want. Well, the yeah, it's, it's certainly going to be no cakewalk because there are a significant number of stumbling blocks for the top seeds in each of these regions. As we move down, East Region will uh, take a look at the uh, number one seed in the West, and that is Gonzaga. And everyone wondered how far were they going to be up the ladder. They ended up at number one. My wife makes fun of me because I pick Gonzaga every year. 
here to go far in the tournament <laughs> and they end up losing. But uh, past is not prologue. This is a well-balanced team, the most balanced team. They got greatness at every position and a great coach. I think this is their year to get it done and go to the final. I'm with you there. Arizona, obviously, a formidable challenge, assuming they get through, and I think they will. I think it'll be Arizona coming out. So Now, I know that I know that you guys are high on Florida Gulf Coast. Yeah, I love They're those. one of those exciting teams that yep. just isn't known nationally as much as they should be. I, Size, athleticism, excellent guards. When you talk about Brandon Goodwin, Zach Johnson, Christian Terrell, I mean, these guys are really solid, and they have size up front. I like Florida. Obviously, the tough game, Florida State, but Xavier lost its point guard, Edmund Sumner, if they should play them, and Maryland hasn't played as well down the stretch as well. So I think if you're looking for an upset pick to go to the Sweet 16, Florida Gulf Coast is a great one. And by the way, Arizona's sitting there saying, yeah, I dare you to forget about us. I dare you. Yeah, Sean Miller's got a long memory. <laughs> I will uh, tell you this, Steve though, this North Dakota Fighting Hawks team has some physical guards that can score the basketball, decent size. Arizona wins that game, but I think it might be a little more headwind than you think. All right, let's I will say I think this is the weakest of the four regions. All right, let's go to the other side of the bracket now, and we will look at the Midwest region where the number one seed is Kansas. Well, again, the one seed being able to go to this region, the regionals being played in Kansas City, they're going to be a very, very tough out there. And uh, again, I think that Louisville uh, Michigan potential second round matchup is going to be a doozy. And I like the Cardinals. I picked the Cardinals to get out of this region, but if there is a sleeper, if there is a sleeper, I think it's Iowa State. Familiarity, comfort, if in fact they were meet Kansas, they've beaten them there at Allen Field. So this is a team that has senior leadership, high octane offensive firepower, tough matchups. If there's a team that would come out of there outside of one of the top four seeds, I think it might be, it would be Iowa State. Now, look Rhode at the, Island playing as well as anyone right now, folks. And look at the rest of the lower part of that bracket. Oregon, certainly a wounded team having lost one of its leaders. Michigan, hard charging at the end of the regular season mm -hmm. and into the tournament. And then there's Louisville. Uh, all, nope. yeah, Go on, say. I mean, so all those teams are super high. Rhode Island's not a huge high scoring team, but the rest of them love to get out and go. A team that I like, and it's a tough matchup for them, is Vermont. The Catamounts have a very balanced team, a tough team. Purdue's size might be a little too much for them. I like Purdue, but Vermont is a team to keep an eye on. If you want a double digit seed, there's enough upset. Just want to say again, in case it happens, Nevada, Sweet 16. Go on. Okay, meanwhile, <laughs> in the South now, the number one seed in the South. Is North Carolina it surprised you guys because you thought perhaps that Duke would qualify as a number one seed? Can you argue against North Carolina? No, you can't argue against North Carolina. Arizona certainly deserved consideration. That's who I had on that line. But again, it's splitting hairs. It's a real fine line. And Mark Hollis explained the scrubbing process. It's hard to move up a lot of seed lines once you get on a line. It's hard to move up or down. I have to say, North Carolina can win the national championship. They're a great team. You can make a case for them being on the one line. The fact that a, a different team where they started the week and had a hard time moving up that didn't uh, I didn't quite buy that 100% yeah. let's tell me where they are right now is where they should be in the bracket but certainly North Carolina it's just you're talking about North Carolina UCLA potentially having to go through Kentucky and North Carolina to get to the final four I think they're going to do it if they get to Phoenix they will have absolutely earned that spot did you like the job that the, the committee did are you satisfied with the bracket you're yeah right? well, oh without, I am clearly because they put time and effort into it it's all there you always have a few hair splitting issues but at the end of the day the bracket is laid out based on the information and they do a phenomenal job at getting to it now you can debate a couple of points but it's not even worth the energy for what it results in in terms of the bracket and its balance so i'm fine with it wichita state is a great example i mean let's remember there was some talk if wichita state had lost in their conference tournament about whether they'd even get in as an at large i thought they would get in but maybe as a first four so they do end up on the 10 line uh, based on you know their overall but you can't see work. based yeah. on projections yeah or no, past I, I, history. Agree. I agree you can't see that way yeah, so you have absolutely. to go with, and if a team falls on a line or two above or below what you think they have done in the past that to me is irrelevant and ultimately you still got to produce whatever your seed line is. And if you're, over, if you're overly concerned about it as a team or coach, you got problems. All right, guys, one of the great stories in this year's field is Northwestern. The number eight seed in the West region is in the tournament for the first time in that school's history. And we are joined now live by the man guiding the Wildcats through their historic season. That's head coach Chris Collins. Chris, thank you for joining us. You know, now that you've had a little while to think about it, although I'm sure it was kind of on your mind down the stretch of the season, how does this, it's a truly historic event happening in the history of Northwestern University. How are you feeling about it now? I'm feeling great, guys. I mean, when I came four years ago, it was a belief in a day like today. You know, it was a belief that we could become a program that could eventually 
compete in NCAA tournaments and to see these guys go out and win the way they did this year and, and to have it kind of be my first group of guys in a four-year span, guys that believed in us when all we were all we were talking about was a vision and a dream, you know, to see today, to see thousands of people come out and people that have been watching this team play for years and years and the smiles on their faces. And like I told them all, you, very rarely in life do you get a chance to be a part of something that's never, ever been done. And for that, we're all lucky and grateful and, and honored to be a part of this. Well, it's been fun watching you guys do this for the first time, Chris, and congratulations again. Now, how do you flip the script, if you will, to move forward to preparing? Now, give us a sense of what that process and order will look like for you, your staff, and your players. Yeah, well, now it's time to get to work. You know, I wanted the guys to enjoy today. Um, this has been a lot of work, uh, a lot of ups and downs, you know, to get to this moment, to enjoy it with our fans and our team. But now we get to work. You know, we, we play in a very tough Vanderbilt team. I have an amazing amount of respect for Bryce and the job that he does and, and how much better they I've had a chance to see them a few times this year. And they've been a hot team down the stretch. So, you know, we know we're going to have to get to work these next couple days and, and lock in and you know, for us, we want to we want to win in the tournament. You don't just want to get invited just to be a part of it. Now that you're invited, you you want to go there with an opportunity to win in advance. Well, Chris, I have to be honest. It was Greg Gumbel's idea to have you guys in the final bracket in the show. <laughs> so we were kind of getting late in the show. Was there any doubt or foreboding creeping into your head that maybe this wasn't going to happen? And what, can you describe the feeling of seeing your name finally pop up on that screen? Well, there were a lot of exasperated people in the building as the regions went by, and I told everyone to relax. It's TV. I said, we're, they're going to they're gonna make it interesting. So uh, I knew we were in. I, I didn't know, you know, I, when I saw Wisconsin as an eight, you know, I, I thought that was a little low considering I know how good they are. You know, it, it, it gave me a little wonder where we were going to fit into that mix. But uh, I knew we'd be in there just about where and who we were going to play. And when that name came across, the joy in that arena, the smiles, to see the players jumping around. I mean, that's why you do this. I mean, there, there's nothing better than this tournament. There's nothing better than this time of year. And for us to be a part of it is, uh, is going to be really special, guys. Chris, one of the things that you know well about March Madness, of all the excitement and the competitive aspect on the court, there are also feel-good stories, and your guys are certainly part of that. We thank you very much for joining us. We wish you good luck in the coming tournament. NCAA tournament coverage begins Tuesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time on True TV. The first four has Kansas State facing Wake Forest and Mount St. Mary's taking on New Orleans. Then Wednesday on True TV, North Carolina Central meets UC Davis. Providence will play USC. First round action tips at noon Eastern time on Thursday and Friday. And you can follow all of the games on CBS, TBS, TNT, and True TV. When the selection show continues, our final four forecast. Our panel in Atlanta predicts the four teams heading to Phoenix. Who will be there at the end? Find out after this timeout. Don't forget to play the Bleacher Report Bracket Challenge presented by Allstate, official protector from March Mayhem. You and a friend could win the ultimate sports trip and go to any four sporting events of your choice this year. Go to bracketchallenge.bleacherreport.com to register now. Well, over the next few days, millions of you will try to master the art of bracketology. We thought you would appreciate a few helpful hints for filling out your brackets. Chuck knows not to pick a 16 over a 1 because it never, ever, ever happens. And if your argument is, well, the Cubs can win the World Series, this ain't baseball. Well, what about the 15? No, not even if it's your granny's lucky number. They've only beaten the two eight times in 128 games. And come week two, know this, that no 15, 14, or even 13 seed has ever gone from sweet to elite. 
But if you still really want to dance with Cinderella, then ask the 12 seed to tango. In 28 of the last 32 years, the 12 has won at least one game in the round of 64. And 20 of 46 have boogied their way to the Sweet 16, with one even making it to the Elite Eight before poof, turning into a pumpkin. The nine versus eight game, that's a toss-up. But in 85, the eight was great, winning six straight. Now, if you don't like getting frisky with Risky, stick to the ones. They've won 17 of the last 25 championships. And no matter what I say or seeds you choose, we're in this together three weeks of the Bracket Blues. We know this is such a huge time for so many players going to the dance. I wanted to spotlight a few. I call these under the radar guys. They're playing for teams that are under the radar. And I say they're under the radar because they're all under six feet tall. So a couple of guys to keep an eye on over the next couple of days. Uh, number zero is Junior Robinson, who is 5'5 for Mount St. Mary's. That is the shortest player in Division I uh, playing for the Mount. You're going to see him in the first four taking on uh, New Orleans. Keon Johnson plays for Winthrop. He's 5'7. Shout out Rock Hill, South Carolina. First appearance since 2010 for Winthrop. He's the Big South Player of the Year. And uh, Christavius Gill is 5'8 and will be playing in that first four. And you got Marcus Howard of Marquette at 5'11". So take a look at those guys as the tournament gets underway. Okay, I want to know from, from you guys, Gary and, and Chuckster, uh, is there a sleeper? Is there someone you're looking for who's, gonna, who's going to surprise us? I would say Rhode Island is my sleeper, and here's why. That's a team that was preseason top 25 in America, banged up, had injuries, but now they're healthy. Finally, they're on an eight-game winning streak, and if you look at their road, they get to play Creighton in the round of 64. Creighton's without Edmund Sumner. They play Oregon, possibly, round of 32. Oregon, of course, is without Chris Boucher, so they're healthy. Their possible opponents aren't. Chuckster. Well, listen, Arnie, you know, the bracket is always difficult. I got a, some teams I think got a really good chance of upsets early. Uh, Florida Gulf Coast, Virginia Tech, Rhode Island, Vandy. This is going to be my sleeper. Seton Hall, Xavier Marquette, and Middle Tennessee. Those, if you're trying to fill out your bracket, I think all those teams got a good chance with the upset. While you've got the ball, give me your final four. I got Villanova, Arizona, Louisville, and North Carolina. You got a, you got a champ? I'll take that as a no. Uh, I got Pick it. one, Chuck. Arizona. Arizona. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Gary, what do you think? If I'm going to be the guy uh, picking Duke to be a one seed, I better take them out of the East, so I will with Gonzaga, Kansas, UCLA. I'll have Duke and UCLA uh, playing in the national championship game. And national champion? Uh, give me Lonzo Ball and the Bruins. And before uh, before the Boucher injury, I was all about Oregon, and now I have absolutely no clue. We'll take you back to New York after this. Sports NCAA Men's Basketball Championship Selection Show is sponsored by the Quicksilver Card from Capital One. Coca-Cola. Taste the feeling. And by AT&T. We welcome you back to our New York studio, everyone. Here's a look at the conferences that earned multiple bids. The ACC has nine teams in the tournament, too shy of the record for most bids by a conference. The Big East and the Big Ten both play seven. The Big 12 gets six, while the SEC five and the Pac-12 has four. Yeah, I told you to pump your brakes on that 11 ACC. Hey, that wasn't me. Hey, <laughs> that was Rothstein. <laughs> nine is an unbelievably strong year. Excellent work, but 11... That's, um, yeah, that was a no, reach. That was, that was a reach. That was, that was a reach. Never How about yeah. the Big East, by the way, getting 70% uh, of their team? Mm -hmm. Very and, impressive. And it's, look, we've been doing this a long time. It is a shame that these mid-major schools have a, such a hard time getting the schedule required to get into this tournament. It's not fair. It's not right. But it is the way it is. All right. We expect the elite teams to advance deep in the bracket. Let's talk about sleeper picks that could make a run. We heard from the guys down in Atlanta. What do you think? There are a couple that I have, but I'm going to lean with Iowa State. Just because you look at the bracket for Iowa State, they would be very familiar with the Kansas if they had that matchup. They've actually beaten Kansas, and they're playing good basketball, like a number of teams are at this point in time. And the key in the tournament, that's why it's so unpredictable, is that you have to be able to survive if you don't play your best, but more times than not, you have to play close to your best to advance. And the teams that do that game at a time do it. And oftentimes, pressure goes to 
the favorites if games are tight. He likes to take little naps with his sleepers in Iowa State. I, I like to go into a deep sleep <laughs> in Middle Tennessee. I just think the memory of beating Michigan State. Now, what last is a year, sleeper? Does that mean what? Sweet 16? If they're a double digit seed, get sleep, into the elite eight? You can find it. Beauty okay. I, I was I'm asking. I'm a sleeping beauty. Okay. Sleeping beauty. I, I love you pick a sleeper and then you ask, what is a sleeper? <laughs> well, time to put you on the spot now. Who makes it to the Final Four? I think we're in, we're in for a um, repeat champion. Um, it's been, what, 10 years since we've had that? 2006, yeah, 2006 7? Yeah. yeah, Florida. I think Villanova gets it done, but these are my final four teams. And um, I like Gonzaga, UCLA, Louisville, and Nova, as you can see on the screen, to be final four. Seth? I, I see I'm half right because I got uh, two in agreement with them. We both have Gonzaga going to the final four. It'll be interesting if they can uh, yeah, that's get that's off nothing new for you. I, no, that's <laughs> for sure. And uh, Duke and Kansas uh, out of the Midwest. And I like uh, Duke to beat Kansas in the national championship game. I've liked Kansas for for most of the final stretch here because of their guards and their ability to win. Duke right now, they're playing so well, they're healthy, they got great momentum coming out of that East. I was going to ask you, does it not weigh on you as to who is playing their best basketball right now? It does to a degree, but it's how you perform on the game night that you have to play or game day, and that's why this thing is such a wonderful, unpredictable ride. Let's get it on. Relax, get some sleep, and we'll be back. Uh, How you get it started play on Tuesday. game night, which is why I told you a 16 seed will. No, eat not happening. Not happening. Not happening. Not happening. Not happen. That will do it for us <laughs> for now. For more reactions and predictions, our Selection Sunday coverage continues right now over on CBS Sports Network with NCAA March Madness bracket breakdown only on the 24 hour home of CBS Sports. Tonight on CBS begins with 60 minutes and a Russian opposition leader who was poisoned, followed by a new episode of NCAA. CIS Los Angeles, Madam Secretary, and Elementary. That's tonight, only CBS. For Ernie Johnson, Charles Barkley, and Gary Parrish down in Atlanta, Clark Kellogg, Seth Davis, and for all of us here in New York at CBS Sports, I'm Greg Gumbert. Thank you for watching. Enjoy the madness, everybody.